This conference will now be recorded. All right, well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome again to today's Virtual Visitor Center. My name is Kaylee Matuzak, and I'm the Executive Museum Assistant for the William A. Irvin Ore Boat Museum here in Duluth, Minnesota, where I currently am. So I do a little bit of everything on the Irvin. My Executive Museum Assistant job usually means that I get to deal with uh, collections management and any donations that we get. So I get to see and do a lot of really, really cool stuff on the boat, but I'm also a tour guide as well. So today I'm going to share with you just a ton of awesome information about the boat. We'll go through her history and then talk about what's going on today more recently and we'll even get into some spooky stuff near the end whether you believe in ghosts or not since it is October and we are known as the haunted ship around here. But to start you off we'll start at the beginning because that's a pretty easy place to begin things. So We'll take it back to early 1929 and uh, the Pittsburgh Steamship Company and U.S. Steel are having one of their best seasons on record. So the fleet has over 70 vessels. There's two more that are going to be in construction and that's uh, some of the biggest fleet that they've ever had. So they might have had more vessels back when boats were smaller, but this was like as strong as they were going to be until the end of 1929. So 1929 ends the markets crash, the Great Depression begins, and shipbuilding pretty much grinds to a halt. So those two ships that are in construction, they launch to a market that is pretty much non-existent. Lots of vessels are laid up, lots of vessels are scrapped. And by 1932, less than 4 million tons of iron ore are being shipped. Before the Depression, this number was over 15 times that. So things are looking pretty dire. But 1937 comes around, and U.S. Steel is realizing that the markets are starting to get better. They want to show that they're confident in the markets and they're confident that things are going to turn around. So they order construction on four new vessels to be built. So the first two of those vessels, uh, these were built in Michigan at uh, the Great Lakes Engineering Works. We have the, uh, Ralph, the Ralph H. Watson up there and then the John Hulst on the bottom. So these are the first two. Uh, that were ordered into construction. And then the next two, uh, these were built by American Shipbuilding Company in Lorain, Ohio, the Governor Miller and the William A. Irvin. So these two ships were considered the flagships of the fleet at the time. They look pretty much identical, as you can see from these pictures. And uh, we actually have a tour guide who works on the Irvin currently. His name is Brian. He used to sail on the Governor Miller. And he's told me the only difference between the William A. Irvin and the Governor Miller was pretty much the uh, nameplate that said the name of the vessel. So two beautiful, beautiful boats, four in total that were ordered for this fleet. And something special that the uh, Miller and the Irvin actually have are guest quarters that are really, really grand. So we'll uh, get into those a little bit later, but beautiful, beautiful ships. <laughs> now, uh, you might be wondering who is William A. Irvin, why is there a boat named after him? Uh, I found this uh, cute little graphic today, actually, that's basically just his entire biography uh, sketched out there. But uh, he was born on December 7th, 1873 in Indiana, Pennsylvania. And he worked his way up to eventually become the president of U.S. Steel. He did a whole bunch of odd jobs and uh, he did marry the daughter of one of the wealthiest families in Indiana, Pennsylvania. So that might have helped him a little bit, too. But he was the president that guided U.S. Steel through the Depression, and then uh, he was the vice chairman of the board of U.S. Steel from 1938 to 1952 when he died. So that's why he's got a boat named after him. If you actually put a list of uh, past U.S. Steel presidents next to a list of uh, boats that have existed, you'll see a lot of uh, similar names because if you're president of U.S. Steel, you're pretty likely to get a vessel named after you. So the launching of the Irvin, she was actually launched on November 10th, 1937. And uh, you can see in this picture here, when she was launched for sea trials, she doesn't even have uh, her smokestack on yet. And the guest quarters and everything up in the front end are still pretty empty. So they just wanted to see if the thing could float or not. And she was the first ship to be built for the Great Lakes in over seven years by the time she was launched. So uh, officially launched November 10th, 1937. She actually made her first voyage June 25th, 1938. 
And just a uh, quick little rundown of some fast facts about the Irvin. So like we said, uh, sailed June 25th, 1938 until December 15th, 1978. That's when she ended up retiring. Uh, the Irvin is 610 feet long, 60 feet wide, and about 32 feet deep with 18 cargo hatches across the spar deck. And then the cargo holds are divided into three. The Irvin could carry about 14,000 tons. So capacity that seems pretty big, but as you'll get to see a little later on, not so big at all. And the Irvin had uh, two steam turbine engines, about 1,000 horsepower apiece, 2,000 horsepower total. So the Irvin and the Governor Miller were two pretty uh, technologically advanced ships for uh, all intents and purposes. Uh, the four ships that launched together, uh, they were the first ships on the Great Lakes to use steam turbine engines. So uh, that's a pretty interesting development for that. And the Urban uh, burned coal. She was a steamship. So she burned 2,400 pounds of coal per hour compared to other vessels that were operating in the day that burned about 3,000 to 4,000 uh, pounds of coal an hour. So you could say that's environmentally friendly, not really since you're burning coal, but it's better than other vessels that were out there. And the Irvin was actually also the first vessel to have enclosed tunnels below deck. So those go alongside uh, the very edges of the ship, right above the ballast tanks. Before you would have had tunnels like that, you would have had to clip yourself onto a lifeline going across the deck back and forth, which in a gale, that would have been pretty awful. So the tunnels definitely would have been something the sailors were happy to have. Those guest quarters that I mentioned, those are also a, a pretty interesting development. Boats did have guest quarters, but most of the time it wasn't anything super, super fancy, more like a smaller room where someone could visit if they needed to. But the Irvin was U.S. Steel's main PR vessel. So you would have industry executives, potential customers, anyone that the fleet wanted to impress would come on board and guests traveled in comfort and absolute luxury. There's pictures here of two of our guest rooms that I took the other week. The uh, Urban had four guest rooms total and a whole lounge and a private dining room, lots and lots of nice stuff specifically for the guests. Now, during the Irvin's career, uh, I think it's pretty cool that she ended up getting docked as a museum here in Duluth because half of her career voyages began from the port of Duluth Superior and Two Harbors would have been a close second behind that. Uh, the main places she would go, she would carry uh, iron ore from uh, this region here in Duluth down to South Chicago, Gary, Indiana, Lorain, Ohio, anywhere down there to the steel mills. and. Uh, most of the cargo she did carry was iron ore or taconite, but she also carried loads of limestone, coal, and slag over the time that the Urban was a working vessel. But again, mostly iron ore. And the Urban actually got its first radar set in 1948. Before that, it was all uh, radio direction finders. So uh, there's two radars on board today. That would have been a pretty advanced for the time as well. So, uh, any questions to start you off just uh, with that quick overview of the history? Let me know. I'll give it a couple minutes in the chat. Um, we have one question. Um, what is slag? So slag is basically a kind of a leftover that would uh, leftover from uh, iron, iron ore like making that they would use to make steel. So that would be something important for the steel mills to have. Do you know what the current status of the Governor Miller is? Uh, the Governor Miller was scrapped in the 80s. I have the exact date a little farther along the presentation. Yeah, all of the urban sister ships were scrapped. And was the, I believe they are referencing the Irvin, but was the Irvin a self unloader? Uh, no, the Irvin did not have a self unloader. If anyone has any other questions, I think we'll take another minute here. Um, and if you think of something afterwards, there will be a couple other question segments.
Uh, okay. Slight correction. I, I had confusing wording on the slag thing. It's a steel making byproduct. Steel making byproduct. Oh, that's what slag is. Okay. Um, and then last question for a little bit. Uh, what was her rated service speed? Uh, so uh, fully loaded, the urban could travel about 11 miles an hour, unloaded 12 and a half miles an hour. So she was actually the slowest ship that U.S. Steel owned. Okay, I think if you're ready to continue or if you wanted to wait, it's your choice. Yeah, we can keep going. I have plenty of uh, little question spots throughout. So part one was the beginning, part two is the end. <laughs> so by the mid 1970s, uh, the Irvin is starting to become obsolete. Uh, the Irvin actually last carried guests in those beautiful guest quarters in the summer of 1975. When the Roger Blau was built in 1972, that became kind of the new queen of the fleet and where the guests flocked to as uh, the Roger Blau had air conditioned and heated guest quarters, which uh, the Irvin did not have air conditioning. So traveling in the summer, the Blau, would have, <laughs> I understand why people would have wanted to travel on there. And when guests stopped traveling on the Irvin, uh, the mates actually got letters that said they were allowed to move forward into the guest quarters because the, uh, um, well, I guess technically backwards because the mates rooms were forward towards the front of the ship. Guests are a little back. Uh, they were allowed to move into the guest quarters, but they were told pretty sternly that if guests ever wanted to come back, they would have to get out of Dodge and move back to their quarters. But it would have been a pretty nice place to be. Now, I mentioned earlier on that the Urban could carry about 14,000 tons of iron ore or whatever cargo. And that number seems really big, but I have a timeline here. You can tell that's actually not that big. And even when the Urban was built, it wasn't uh, really setting records for amount of cargo to be carried. So in 1929, when the Carl D. Bradley was built, she was 639 feet long, so a little bit longer than the Irvin, and could carry uh, over 18,000 tons of cargo. So already that's a lot more, well, about 4,000 more tons than the Irvin. 1962 comes around and uh, the Edward L. Ryerson, uh, which is also laid up here in Duluth right now, uh, could carry about 25,000 tons of cargo and 730 feet long, so even longer. And then uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald comes around in 1969. It set a cargo record with uh, about 27,000 tons of cargo, 729 feet long. And then we start getting into the thousand footers. So uh, the Stuart J. Court, uh, over 49,000 tons of cargo. And then in 1978, the same year that the Irvin uh, was decommissioned, uh, when the Gott was built, over 62,000 tons and over 1,000 feet long. So really, really dramatic changes in the amounts of cargo, as you can tell. And the Irvin was just seeming a little bit small, which it was. So uh, whoever asked the speed question, a little bit ahead of me, uh, the Irvin and the Miller were the slowest vessels in U.S. Steel's fleet, uh, 11 miles an hour loaded, 12 and a half miles an hour empty. Thousand footers could uh, travel fully loaded uh, 15 to 17 miles an hour, so a decent amount faster. And the Irvin burned coal while most new vessels were using diesel. So uh, with those speeds in mind, the fastest vessels could make five day round trips from Duluth Superior to the Lower Lakes. The Urban was lucky to do that same trip in about seven days. So if you were to take an eight month season, which is the longest season that really the Urban would have been traveling during, uh, at that speed, the Urban could do 35 round trips. Vessels that took five days could do 49 round trips. So that's a pretty uh, telling number there. Another kind of issue with the Irvin, okay, there we go. Uh, another issue with the Irvin's uh, numbers was the crew capacity. So the Irvin generally carried a crew of 32. When they had guests on board, they would uh, bring extra crew on board. So porters and cooks to take care of the guests specifically. Newer vessels, crews were in the mid 20s. Sometimes they could be even smaller. Uh, those tug barge combinations had very, very small crews. So got a slow vessel and a big crew. 
that's going to mean some lost money for U.S. Steel. One thing that uh, could have possibly saved the Irvin was uh, when they were starting to revamp some vessels by putting cell phone loaders on or uh, cut them in half, add some more cargo space, and then send them back out. Any kind of thing like that would have been too expensive to uh, really make up for the difference that the Irvin would have been added. So uh, things were looking bleak for a little 610 footer. The Irvin's last voyage, uh, kind of sad. The crew didn't know that it was going to be the last voyage. So December 10th, 1978, they leave Sandusky, Ohio with a load of coal. They get up to Duluth uh, by December 15th, so uh, pretty fast, and uh, drop off the coal and then go to Fraser Shipyard in Superior, Wisconsin for winter layup. Uh, interestingly enough, 1978, that season was actually one of the Urban's top years. So 476,114 tons of cargo over the course of 37 trips, but it just wasn't enough to keep the boat in commission. There we go. So 1979, uh, the season starts. The Irvin is not included in that season. Uh, she spends most of her layup at a dock out in West Duluth with a whole bunch of her fleet mates. The Irvin was uh, the vessel that was on the inside, so right next to the dock and then surrounded by a bunch of other boats, which will come into play a little later on. But uh, the Governor Miller was scrapped in 1980. The John Hulst scrapped in 1983 and the Ralph H. Watson was sold in 1987 and then scrapped in 1989. So during this time, uh, boats are leaving the dock one by one to be scrapped. One thing that helped save the Irvin was the fact that it was really hard to get to. You would have had to move a bunch of boats out of the way specifically to grab the Irvin and take it somewhere. So as these boats are being scrapped and the Irvin is sitting around, uh, 1983 comes around and there's conversations kind of starting up in Duluth, like, hey, that's a pretty nice boat that we just have sitting here. Someone should do something with it. And it continued sitting around until uh, 1986. April 15th, the Duluth Entertainment Convention Center board votes to buy the Irvin uh, for $110,000, which was the price of scrap. And there were tons of ideas thrown around for use. People wanted to put a restaurant on board. People wanted to put a hotel on board, have some museum space, have some meeting rooms. Uh, I've seen plans that actually had the Irvin connected to the Duluth Skywalk system through the deck. So there were plans to put a Skywalk into the front and into the back, which I think would have looked kind of hilarious and I'm glad they didn't end up doing, but lots of things thrown around and eventually the idea that they landed on was a museum ship, which is what we are today. Take another short break if anyone has any questions about that portion of the Irvin's moving line. We have a question. Um, hold on, we got a couple at once. Do we know why they chose to become a museum specifically? Um, you know, that's a good question. I've looked at the plans that the city had, and I think that uh, the Irvin as a museum was like the most surefire way that they would make money without having to change a lot of things because any of the like restaurant or hotel ideas would have uh, involved a huge amount of overhauling and in addition to uh, hoping that that idea worked and a museum is not foolproof obviously but a lot easier to operate on a lower budget um how long has the ship been opened as a museum uh, it actually, uh, we'll get into that in just a little bit, so. <laughs> no spoilers, okay. Um, spoilers. <laughs> how expensive is the upkeep? It really, really depends. So I know that we aren't able to do as much as we would like. Uh, luckily, a couple years ago, we got some really good grants for some upkeep, and I'll get into those numbers in a little bit, too. Um, and... 
Could you repeat the maximum and minimum number of trips per season? Yeah, let me go back to that number. So if you were to have an eight month season, so a really, really long season, uh, the urban is doing about 35 trips per season. Uh, could be, that's an average. So 35, 37 was their best season in 1978. And vessels that only take five days to do that round trip could do uh, 49 on average. Um, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I might be able to help in a second. But um, how do crew members get back home if the vessel is laid up for winter? And uh, is the you know from the what was that? Do you know the answer to that? I, I don't know the answer. I'll say so. Um, when it comes to the crew of the ship, a lot of them, um, I would say, a lot of them sometimes they could be from the town and sometimes it's not too far of a trip uh but sometimes they have to travel a couple lakes over a couple states over to get back home let's do a hypothetical not everyone uh who worked in the urban when it was laid up lived in duluth so, you know some of the people had to go back home some folks are from michigan some folks are from all around so um it's kind of like a traveling job i'd say if there are any other questions um go ahead and send it now we'll just wait a couple more seconds i think and then Kaylee will continue. Oh, sure. Great question so far, by the way, everybody. I was afraid I wouldn't get like any. So this has been really, really nice. All right, nothing new has been sent. If you wanted to continue, feel free. All right, let's get at it. So part one, the beginning, part two, the end, part three, the beginning again. So the Irvin's got a new life going for it. So things started happening pretty quickly after the deck did buy the Irvin in uh, April of 86. Uh, they sent it over to Fraser Shipyards for a uh, overhaul of renovations. Uh, so May 12th to about June 17th, 1986, they were, excuse me, working on the vessel. And after it was just sitting in layup for a while, uh, I've seen quotes that say there wasn't a scrap of paint left anywhere in the engine room, so they had to do a lot of work to uh, make it safe for tour groups to go through, just make it look pretty and shiny again. Opening day was supposed to be June 21st, 1986, but the deck had trouble getting the correct liability insurance, so it was delayed by a week, and they were able to open up on June 28th, 1986. Uh, we got our National Register of Historic Places designation in 1989, which is really cool. And in the picture you can see here, that's where the urban was originally docked, uh, just right behind the convention center on the harbor side. That was while they were getting Minnesota Slip, where the urban currently sits, all clean and ready to go. And that's where the urban has been ever since. Uh, in the first two weeks of the Irvin being open, they had over 10,000 visitors for tours. So it was very popular and people around here were very excited that the Irvin was open. Now, if you are someone that is from the Duluth area or maybe you've just seen the news uh, a while ago, just, uh, September 21st, 2018, the Irvin left and Minnesota Slip was empty for the first time in a really long time. So you can see the picture there. Looks pretty strange without a big boat in it. Uh, they had to do some fixing of the seawall along the edge of the slip. They had to dredge some sediment out. Uh, the slip is actually, the bottom of it's kind of at an angle. So uh, the furthest in end towards the land, it's about uh, 10 feet deep. And the far end out towards the harbor side is uh, about 26 feet deep. So there was a lot of sediment that was in there, a lot of pollution that was in there. So to properly clean it up, the urban left. So we got a uh, $504,000 grant awarded for restoration. So while the boat was gone, they decided, why don't we do some fixing up on the boat too? Uh, so I went over to Fraser Shipyards and got sandblasted, painted, a marine epoxy put on it so the bottom wouldn't corrode. And uh, here's a fun question for you. You can uh, send your answers to the chat. Out of uh, that huge number of rivets, uh, 687,412, how many do you think they needed to replace? Because they had to completely replace uh, a number of rivets. Uh, 
We have one guess that is more than half. Oh no, that would be very, very troublesome. <laughs> 400,000 is another guess. 152,000, 10, 250. Uh, whoever said 250, you are closest. It was 285 rivets had completely corroded and had to be replaced. So pretty decent number. Uh, it would have been very bad if it was a lot more than that. We have some pictures coming up in the slideshow too, so you can see just how corroded the bottom of the vessel was. And I have a quick little time lapse here of the urban being moved out of Minnesota Slip. So bear with me while I click this link and hope it works. Uh, yeah. So uh, you can see the blue slip bridge that usually crosses the opening of the slip there. They had to pin it back really, really far because that wasn't there when the urban was originally put into Minnesota slip and there's about six inches of clearance. So they had to be very, very careful. But here's a uh, time lapse of the four hours it took to move the urban. It's a little choppy. I, I have a link at the end for it, uh, a smoother version of it that you can take a look at too. You can see they're moving it with back hose. <laughs> And again, I will provide a link to this if uh, you would like to see it in a little better fashion. But <laughs> then the urban finally uh, did come back last October. So it is again open for tours. Um, one second, my screen is glitching a little bit. There we go. So we have a photo gallery on the deck website with a whole bunch of these pictures that I've also linked to, but you can see uh, just how bad the bottom of the ship was looking. And then you can kind of see the paint job there fixing it up. The Irvin really is looking better than it has in a really long time. It's so, so, so exciting to see uh, that paint job on the outside is looking great. And we uh, got a grant from the Historical Society to completely sandblast our hatch crane. Uh, that's the thing that moves up and down the deck to take the hatch covers off so you can put cargo in the holds. So completely sandblasted, completely repainted, and it's looking very, very nice. But if you're interested in seeing more of these pictures, again, I'll have the link at the end for you. Uh, any quick questions before we get into uh, another part of this that I think will be very fun? Uh, we'll take a quick virtual tour of the entire ship. Um, you do have a couple questions. Um, what dates did the Irvin return? Like during the 20s? Was it 2020? Um, I know it was last October. Let me see what the actual date was because I know I have it in my notes here. You can go on to the next question. I will multitask. Um, how many, let's see, how many visitors do you get these days on average? Uh, so the number of this specific weird year, I don't know off the top of my head, but I do know that it's the same number as we've had in like regular seasons. So our our ticket sales have been really, really awesome. And it's been exciting that people have been wanting to come out even when it's a, a station to station self-guided tour do you know what the wednesday is? october 16th. oh sorry repeat that wednesday october 16th of 2019 so okay um so that's when she returned and do you know what the draft is of the urban sitting in the slip uh sitting in the slip if you're standing on the deck you are about uh 23 feet above the surface of the water so if we were because we got ballast pumped out and everything so if it was loaded you'd be sitting quite a bit lower 
Um, what parts of the ship are operational? I've been told theoretically everything. If you had enough coal, you could power it up and take it out for a spin. Uh, I do know that uh, in the engine room, all of the buttons and switches that kids like to touch are operational. And somebody actually accidentally knocked out the power in the engine room a couple weekends ago playing with buttons. <laughs> so <laughs> it is a working vessel. Um, how deep are the rust spots? And how thick is the hole? That might be a difficult question. Those are two great questions. Um, I don't know uh, the answer to either of those, actually. So that is a very good question. I'll have my email at the end. And if there's any hard ones that you want to send back to me, I can uh, do some research when I'm back on the boat next week and <laughs> send those answers out to you. Okay, no more questions as of right now. I think you're, I think you're good to okay, go. Okay, awesome. Well then, here is your ticket for a uh, virtual tour. Uh, just a kind of bonus that it matched the color scheme of the presentation template I picked. So I feel pretty cool about that. So uh, I'll take you through some areas that you do get to see on tour, some areas that are currently roped off uh, due to social distancing that you'll get to see close up and a few areas that uh, aren't on tour at all right now. So some little bonuses. These are just some uh, close-up photos that I took in the engine room the other day. Uh, these are areas that you can't really get super close up to right now. So on the right, this is our Chadburn. So the Chadburn is kind of the communication device between the uh, pilot house and the engine room. We currently have this disconnected uh, from each other so that we're not constantly pranking each other with really loud bells when we show it off. But uh, in the pilot house, uh, someone moves the handle and the little arrow down in the engine room moves to tell them what they should be doing with the engines. And as soon as the arrows are unaligned, there is a very loud bell that rings to let the folks in the engine room know that there's something they need to attend to. And then here's a side look at our engines. So again, we have uh, two of those steam-powered turbine engines, uh, the one with the red light on it, and then the other one is on the other side over here. About a thousand horsepower a piece, 2000 horsepower total. Here's a look up into the top of our engine room. Uh, it's really nice hanging out in there because it's really bright and airy, which you wouldn't really expect from an engine room. Uh, thanks to those skylights that you can see at the top of the image, those can be open to bring cool breezes down into the engine room because it can get really hot down there. Uh, during the height of summer on the lower lakes, it could be upwards of 120 degrees in the engine room. So a cool breeze would be very, very welcome. Here's a peek into an area that you can't see close up on tour, but we're hoping we can open up as a uh, exhibit space in the future. This is the chief engineer's office, and this is located right in the engine room. So it would have been a pretty bad space for an office, in my opinion, since it would have been so loud and noisy and hot down there. But the chief engineer's office is one of my favorite places on the ship, just because every single nook and cranny and drawer is full of really, really neat stuff. On the right side, upper right of the image, you can see a cabinet full of keys. Uh, about a month ago, we were trying to find the key to get into the main drawer of that desk. And I tried all of those keys and about 200 others from a bag. And then I finally found it. And then the thing that we were looking for wasn't even in the desk. But I did find some cool uh, US Steel Union stuff. So really interesting stuff all around the ship. And then going a little deeper, uh, there's a door in a bulkhead in the engine room that takes you directly back into the boiler room. And this is a look in there. The boiler room is a very dark and very creepy space that's currently not available for tour. We used to have it open when we offered a hard hat tour. And the hard hat tour was just kind of like a nooks and crannies type of thing. But uh, pigeons get in there and things get uh, pretty creepy pretty fast. So the boiler room's not currently open for view. But uh, you're looking right at part of the lower part of the smokestack and the upper part of the boiler. That's what you can see in that image right there. Again, hopefully we'll have that open for viewing at some point soon. Here's a look into our galley. 
something interesting in the galley, you can see the uh, bars that are on the stove there. Those can actually be moved around to whatever size and shape you need so that if you have pots boiling on the stove and the ship rocks, it can hold them right in place and things don't go spilling all over the place. And then in the second image, uh, the big rectangle in the middle of the room, that's our ice box. Uh, the galley would be open 23 hours a day. Uh, I say 23 because they needed to clean up sometime. But if you were working a shift that didn't really gel with the time that uh, meals were, there would always be leftovers and snacks and sandwiches and fun stuff in the ice box for you to eat. This is a look into one of our crew cabins. So this would have been uh, the room that the porters stayed in. So you got two beds in there. Every room has a bathroom attached to it. And if you're in rooms that have uh, multiple bunks, you're likely on different shifts. So not everybody's crowding in there at once. And then this is the room for the oilers. Three beds in here. Again, hopefully you'd be on differing shifts so you're not tripping over each other. This is a piece that's in our breezeway. So this is the uh, misspelled communication center. Communication center, this would be where uh, union business would be posted, any ship info the guys needed to know. And right under this is a cribbage board built into a table that I unfortunately have cropped out of the image I'm right now realizing. Sorry about that, come on tour and you can see it. But uh, this would have been the space where the guys would hang out on break. You could open doors on either end of the long hallway to get cool breezes coming through. So you could just be, uh, again, cooling down in those hot summer months. Another area that's currently not for view on tour is our fantail. So the anchor is right below uh, the area that I was standing taking the picture. And this is just one of our really nice views of the Duluth Harbor. Again, imagine having to back this boat out through that opening. I sure can't. I mentioned the restoration work that we got to do on the hatch crane. You can see it right here. So the long white beam that says William A. Irvin, that's our hatch crane that opens up the cargo hatches and our smokestack right up there too. Uh, the two little dots at the top, that is where the steam whistle would be blown from. And the green elephant ear shaped things that are at the base of the smokestack, those would have been another way to bring cool air down into the engine room. Uh, the US Steel had the black and the silver as their kind of smokestack coloring, so you would know it was a US Steel ship. The Irvin is frequently referred to as the queen of the silver stackers. Now here's a uh, those guest quarters that I mentioned, we saw the pictures of those right upstairs from there would be the guest's lounge. And here's some pictures from there featuring me taking a picture in the mirror. <laughs> so that's our uh, double wet bar. There's uh, lots of room to lounge in here. And then on the right, kind of a fan favorite, we have our cool Great Lakes lamps. Those aren't original to the Irvin. They're actually from another boat, but I don't know what boat they are from, unfortunately, but they are pretty cool. And then directly behind me in this photo, we have the lounging area of the lounge. So big couch, there would have been uh, more chairs brought in if you had more people on board. And then above the couch there, we have portraits of uh, William A. Irvin, the man himself, and his lovely second wife, Gertrude, in the photo right there. So when there weren't guests on board, the captain could use the guest's lounge as his own personal observation room, kind of a living space. It connects directly to his office and his quarters. And these are some pictures from the captain's office. So you got the bed, not the bed, you got the desk. Uh, on top of the desk, there's a picture of uh, Captain Spencer J. Kidd, who was one of our captains. And uh, he actually, fun fact, he was at the launching of the Irvin in 1937. He didn't know he'd be captaining it one day, so kind of neat. And then right above the desk, uh, you have the picture of the calendar here. The calendar is left on the last day the Irvin was in operation, uh, December 15th, 1978. I guess it was a Friday, but that's a pretty cool piece that we have. And then right upstairs from the captain's quarters and the guest's lounge, we have our pilot house. Uh, there's the Chadburn again, so that's the other side. And then the big handle on the floor is uh, the handle for the steam whistle, conveniently labeled Big Whistle. 
so you know exactly what it is. And then right here, these are our wheels. So the big, uh, the big wooden wheel, that is uh, our hydraulic wheel. So you push in hydraulic fluid to move the rudder. And the smaller wheel is the uh, electric wheel, the gyro pilot. And that actually has an option for uh, kind of a cruise control. That's the word I'm looking for. Lever on the side that you could put it on. And people frequently ask like, oh, which one is, which one is preferred? Which one would uh, the wheelsman use more? And I've actually heard completely conflicting answers from sailors that I've talked to. Some say that the big wooden one was the tried and true, so they would use that when they were uh, docking and doing some, uh, more careful maneuvers, and they'd use the electric wheel only out on the open lake. While some tell me that they would only use the clunkier wooden hydraulic wheel on the open lake, and they would use the smaller electric wheel when they had to do maneuvers. So really, uh, it's up to whoever's driving, which I think is kind of fun. And then here is a nice view from the top. You can see the entire ship, uh, the white boxcar looking area at the bottom of the photo. That is our guest's dining room. So the area for dining that's just for the guests and then a separate galley to make the food for them too. But from this angle, it's always kind of hard to believe that uh, 610 feet is considered small. But when you got thousand footers out there, that is a little bit small. <laughs> Another quick spot, if you have any questions uh, from the photo tour or just anything else that's lingering. Okay, we have one. Um, can you tell us about the type of hatch covers on board and why two types? Yeah, so uh, it's mostly the hatch covers that are closed uh, with, uh, they're called dogs, like the uh, screws that hold them down. Those are watertight, so those are really, really good. And those are the ones that have to be taken off, like lifted up and set down physically by the hatch crane. We have two uh, telescoping hatch covers. Let's see, uh, you can't really, well, you sort of can. Right above uh, the roof of the dining room here, uh, that's one of our telescoping ones. And then we have one on the other side as well, specifically because with the dining box car, you can't get the hatch crane down that far. So those two, uh, they're called telescoping hatch covers and they have to be done completely by hand. So they're kind of shuttered, uh, you tie a rope to it and you pull it back. Those ones aren't watertight, so you'd have to put a tarp over it, and those are not used on boats anymore because not watertight is not good. Good question. Um, are the books in the office original to the ship? Some of them are, some of them aren't. Uh, you can tell which ones aren't original because they have a uh, Duluth Public Library donation stamp inside. Um. Would the ship ever be available for tours during the Gales of November show? That really depends. I know that there's uh, rumblings about doing something different this year. So uh, that is a uh, jurisdiction higher than I. Um, let's see. Oh, is the boat haunted? I'm sure you'll get to that later. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> Um, someone did make a quick comment. Um, they said, quote, I would think the wooden wheel was used in the rivers and for docking the electric for the lakes when you set a course, end quote. Yeah, that's, it's literally like two two guys that we have that work on the boat who, who did sail, who both have different opinions. <laughs> but that does make sense, yes. Okay, um, I guess we can take a couple more seconds here to send any questions if you do have them. Um, um, and of course, at the very end, we will take questions. I'm, is this your last little question uh, slide or is there another one coming before the um, end? I don't think I have one after the haunted part. I think it's just thanks for coming, but we can take them. Okay. All right, I think that's it for right now. Right, lovely. 
So since it is uh, October and it's almost Halloween, got our little October bonus, and that's the spooky stuff. <laughs> so there was one death aboard. This is from the Duluth News Tribune. Uh, in 1964, there was an accident in the boiler room. It was a man named uh, William Worry from uh, International Falls, Minnesota. Uh, two were injured. Uh, he ended up dying. Uh, he was scalded uh, when the uh, water from the boiler tube broke and uh, exploded. So being in the boiler, pretty spooky, aside from the fact that uh, uh, it's very creepy in there, but uh, someone did die in there. And when it comes to ghosts, people generally don't say that they see a man. It's more like a little girl or a woman, which I don't know uh, where she would have come from, but, but hey. These aren't uh, ghostly as much as I just think these are pretty weird coincidences. So three of the really, really major shipwrecks that have happened uh, while the Irvin was in service, the Irvin was lucky enough to not be on the lakes at all. She laid up for the season three weeks before the Fitz went down in 75. She was laid up when the Daniel J. Morrell went down in 66. And she was laid up when the Carl D. Bradley went down in 1958. So if you'd like to uh, draw any weird conclusions, write a folk song about it, whatever you'd like to do. And then haunted ship. Are we haunted just in October or are we haunted full time? We actually have a certificate sitting on our front counter from uh, the Duluth Paranormal Society that we are certified haunted, which is always kind of fun to point to when people ask if we are haunted. Uh, people say yes, people say no. The people who say no generally aren't any fun. Uh, I've definitely had creepy stuff happen to me. Uh, the worst of it was just a well, eh, probably over a month ago now, uh, we were in the cargo hold, me and some of my coworkers uh, standing around talking, which I don't know why, because the cargo hold's really creepy and I don't like it down there, but that's where we were. And uh, we were kind of sit standing in a circle and I was looking at one of my coworkers and like, I heard like something that sounded like a little girl singing, but everybody was talking, so couldn't hear it, but I could tell like looking at her that she heard it too. So I'm like, everybody shut up. What was that? And we stood there and we like looked around and we stood there for probably like a minute and a half. And then we heard it again, but really, really loudly. And half of my coworkers said, let's stay to investigate. But by the time they had said that, I was already off board. I was gone. <laughs> I'm a big scaredy cat. I don't deal with that kind of thing. <laughs> but we do usually uh, in non COVID years, we do a haunted ship. So a big uh, haunted maze walk through in the cargo hold and a bunch of other spooky stuff. I would tell you more about it, but I've never been because again, I think the cargo hold is creepy enough in regular times. <laughs> so this is my thank you for listening slide. And if you do have any more questions, feel free to drop them. But just a couple of links that you can reference here uh, for tour information, the deck website has the urban info. We are still open. Since we're not doing the haunted ship this year, we're still doing regular tours uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday pretty much until the weather completely gives out. So if you are in the area and you would like to come, I would uh, get on the boat as fast as possible. Uh, we also have uh, that info about the move there that has uh, the videos, it has more close up pictures of the hull. And if you have any further questions that you think of later on, feel free to contact me. My email is right there as well, but are there any extra questions hanging out? I'm actually going to steal it from you before the final questions. Um, let me go ahead and take the screen over real quick. All right. Bup, bup, bup. I hope everyone can see it. it says that you all can. Um, so once thank you again, Kaylee, uh, for your presentations. Uh, your presentation. Uh, before questions, I wanted to show you the status of our visitor center. Um, at this time, we have a phased approach, starting with increased outdoor interpretation, uh, tabling, and eventually limited opening. So um, at the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center um, here in Duluth, uh, we currently are in the building. Uh, and during 
hours, we are announcing the vessel arrivals and departures. Um, we have cell phone tours um, that are outdoors. We have a couple signs posted on our building um, telling you how you can access those. There's a virtual online tour of the museum, um, which is also uh, links could be found in the outdoor buildings, uh, outside of our building, I mean, excuse me. Um, and we have outdoor guest services. We are currently out there from 12 to 4 p.m. Um, on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And our gift shop is currently located outside as well. And the Sioux Locks Visitor Center um, in Sioux St. Marie, Michigan, is also announcing vessel arrivals. Um, they have exhibits installed in the park. Um, outdoor guest services are from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. until October 17th. Um, they have a scavenger hunt for the kiddos, for the kids, um, so some outdoor fun. And um, they also have their, their hotline operating until um, October 17th. And their park hours are from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, through the 31st of October. And um, the visitor centers will both reopen um, when we can comply with state and federal guidance and when the local health conditions um, allow it. Um, let me get to the last slide I have here. There we go. Um, so um, at this time, we will be answering uh, the last questions. If you have any, please add them to the chat function. On Please remain muted um, while we are answering questions. I would like to leave up this slide so uh, you can further contact, follow, or find future programs through these links. I'm also going to quick post the link to one second. We have a survey uh, we would like folks to take. Hmm. If only my computer would allow me to post it. That doesn't look like it posted nice. One sec. We can get the hyperlink on there. Ah, it's not letting me. Perhaps Michelle can help me out. Um, but all right, if there are any other questions, I'll quick. Would you like to read them and say them, Kaylee? Or would you like me to read? Facilitate that. Um, I, I guess you can see if there's any that I missed further up. But the one that I see mainly is that uh, how our station tour is conducted. It's pretty easy. We have uh, guides around several of our kind of main rooms and then any rooms that don't have guides have a wonderful signage that I wrote <laughs> that uh, can tell you all about the boat. So it's really self-guided and at your own pace. So even for people who have taken the guided tours before, uh, it's really, really nice because you can kind of spend more time in different rooms if you'd like to. Uh, we think it's going pretty well and that's probably the approach we're going to take for uh, quite a few years in the future for tours. How much and does what it cost? That is a really great question. Uh, let me check the site quick. So I, I don't uh, go in the ticket booth very often. So, oh, uh, one other thing uh, I'm seeing on here on the William A. Urban portion of the deck website, we do have like a cool 3D virtual tour of a few different areas that you can check out as well. So if you uh, go to the uh, uh, deck website with the urban page that I had linked there, you can see that as well. How much are tickets? Tickets are $15 for adults, uh, $10 for students or military with ID and seniors 60 and up, and children 10 and under are free with paid adult tickets. Thank you so much for coming. I, I very and thank you so much for having me for Virtual Visitor Center. This was a really fun time. I guess we can wait another minute for questions if there are any. Uh, once again, it would be very much appreciated if you guys did um, click on that link for the survey. Um, it's just a quick three minute survey. Um, it helps us improve our future programming. Um, everyone's participation is appreciated. I'm going to quick end this recording. I think we're all good. Well, maybe I'll wait a moment.
I think that is it. Um, thank you, Kay Kaylee, for answering those questions. Uh, please follow um, that link once again for the survey. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining.